So imagine with me, if you will, it's Jesus and I in a baseball field. I'm the pitcher. Jesus is the catcher. So as we look around and hear all the noise, the first batter steps up. Jesus crouches, takes his position as catcher. And Jesus begins to give me the signals. You know how it is. The catchers go. It goes like this. It goes like that. The first signal he gives, I pay attention to and I kind of step back a little bit and pause for a second and I look around at all the people in the stadium and I begin to have doubts. So then I look at Jesus again and I say, no, no, not that one. So Jesus gives me a second signal. And once again, I step back a little bit and have pause and look in the dugout and and then I look at my family, and I have more doubts. And now I'm getting more nervous. I really don't know what to do here. I feel that I'm not supposed to feel this way. I've got a batter waiting there. I'm ready to throw the first pitch. And then I shake my head no one more time, and Jesus looks at me again and uh, gives me one more signal. And then I did it a third time. I step back. I have doubts. I was nervous. I, I, I didn't know what to do. So then I decide to throw the first pitch, and boom, guy hits a home run. Next batter comes up, throw another pitch, boom, home run one more time. So I'm not catching it. I'm not getting what the signals that Jesus are telling me. I'm not communicating with Jesus. But I, but I know this, that Jesus is perhaps not frustrated with me, but he's no longer giving me signals because he says, suit yourself, Bob. I'm here to catch. I'm here to be support for you. I'm here to give signals, but if you don't want to receive signals, that's okay. But what happens to me in that is I feel the terrible disappointment that I let my Savior down. And I think so many of us do. We feel disappointed when we let our family and friends down. And it's a horrible, terrible feeling. So we ask the question, is, that, is it that Jesus stopped giving us signals in this life? Is it that we really no longer hear from him? Or is it we make a decision to step back and not pay attention? Is it that we forget about the stresses of life and it throws us off track? Is it that the distractions of this life keep us from paying attention to the signals that Jesus gives us? We oftentimes say, I got this Jesus and don't call upon his name until we experience a trial. And then we wonder where he is. Where did you go, Jesus? Don't you love me anymore? Instead of continually cultivating our relationship with him in the good times and in the difficult times. Because that's what a relationship is. Wouldn't you agree? So what's your why? What is your reason for not communicating and connecting with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? I mean, we can throw all the pitches we want, but don't we really want to know what pitch to throw? What signal Jesus has given you? Because He is a way maker, as the song said. He is the way and the truth and the life. And if we just follow him, we're not going to miss the signal. You see, Jesus is Messiah. He is Lord. He loves you. He cares for you. So as we have a message today that I hope you will see Jesus as a way maker and you might zero in on and listen to the signals he's sending your way as we open up God's Word. Why? Because it illuminates and it, it gives power and it gives hope and it gives refreshing. And once in a while, it gives admonishment as well. So won't you bow your heads with me and pray as we then be jumping into God's Word. Father, we come to you in the mighty and the matchless name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we consider our lives and the brevity of it, Lord, help us to realize the depth of your love for us. 
Help us to realize that you indeed are the way maker. You're the way, the truth, and your life. Lord, I want to come together with my brothers and sisters in Christ now and come to the foot of the cross and confess our sins because we know that when we do, you're faithful and just to forgive us, but also cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If there's anybody here today that's harboring sin or harboring bitterness or harboring anger or harboring disappointment or harboring hopelessness, Lord, I pray that we could all come together at the foot of the cross and get that refreshing and get that renewal by and through your word as we exalt your name on high. Won't you provide answers today for those who are searching? Won't you refresh those who are down and out? Won't you continue to encourage those who are having a great week and month and are happy to look forward to the future? Lord, I pray that they continue to be a light in this dark world. Won't you minister to us today? In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ and all God's children said, Amen. 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 So uh, I wanted to play a little bit of softball today. So, hey, you know, I wanted to do, can, can I throw a couple balls out to see if you guys are attention? So I wanted to do this so bad that I couldn't. Tom, you were too far back, dude. Yeah. There's too many. Ashley. But, okay. This side. All right, here we go. Ricky. Oh, somebody in the back. George, maybe? You too far back? Yeah. Oh. All right. No, it's size not now. Just kidding. <laughs> Now you put your glasses on. Well, I didn't think about that. I didn't process, I didn't process this too well. <laughs> hey, so we're going to jump in John chapter 5. I'm going to read through the first 15 verses and then take a break and then go back through the last verses through 23. So if you guys could join me. Everybody's got a Bible, right? John chapter 5, are you there? Awesome. We've got good students in the room. Okay, if anybody needs a Bible... Alright, so we're going to see Jesus heal a lame man by the pool, verses 1 through 9, so it goes like this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate pool, which is called Hebrew, in the Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Can you guys say that? 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, this is crazy, crazy question, do you want to be made well? Now the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. For while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well and took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Can you guys say Sabbath? Sabbath. People are watching. Verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them. Well, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed. Well, then they asked him, who is this man? Who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was where Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So we're going to stop right there and take a look at uh, each one of these verses one at a time. So first we're going to go to the pool of Bethesda. Verse 1 starts out, after this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So the feast of the Jews really means uh, one of three major feasts that required there's a required attendance. It was either Passover, a feast of Passover, a feast of Pentecost, or a feast of Tabernacle, also known as Purim. So if it was the Passover, that would have really pushed Jesus' ministry into a little over four years instead of three and a half or three and a third years. So now we look at verse 2 again. 
Now they're in Jerusalem, the Sheep Gate. Now if you look back and do a little bit of research there, you see that the, that's the north gate of the temple. You know, Nehemiah mentions it where sheep were actually cleansed and then they were sacrificed in the temple. So it was a pool which is called, in Hebrew, is called Beth, uh, Bethesda, or also Bethsaida. There's a few other names you can pick up on it with different, different spellings. Having five porches. In these lay a great multitude, or a lot, a lot of people, laying around these pools, sick, uh, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain time. Now this seems kind of peculiar, um, this type of healing, but could you imagine the mood surrounding all these pools? People are sick. It's not like modern-day conveniences where you have, you know, all these, um, all these conveniences of, you know, wheelchairs and things like that. This, this was a really, really tough life. But noteworthy is the fact that some of these healings, uh, you can be found in the Old Testament in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was healed by washing in the Jordan River, if you remember that, a couple times. Uh, in the New Testament, you see in Acts chapter 5, some were healed by Paul's handkerchiefs that were laid on him. So, um, it, it, and actually one time there was one where, where people were healed by Peter's shadow walking by. God can do anything he wants, even if it seems weird or odd or peculiar to us. So Jesus questions the lame man. So verse 5 says, at a certain time, which could be a number of things, but more than likely it was one of these great feasts. So there was a man who had infirmity 38 years, 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 meaning that this man had suffered with his paralytic condition for 38 years. Now, we don't know if he was 58 years old and it happened when he was 20 or if he's just a total of 38 years. We're not really sure. But when Jesus saw him lying there, he had already, Jesus knew that he already had this condition. And he asked this really peculiar question, do you want to be made well? It sounds peculiar because I know that if I had been... Um, paralyzed for 38 years, and someone would ask me, hey, do you want to be made well? I'd say, uh, hello, uh, of course I do. Um, however, Spurgeon makes this really keen observation. He said about this, this, whole, this whole subject here, he said, a blindness had overcome these people at the pool. There they were, and there was Christ. Who could heal them, but not a single one of them sought him. Their eyes were fixed on the water, yes. They're expecting it to be troubled or expecting it to be stirred up. They were so taken up with their own chosen way that the true way was actually neglected. He cast a picture of this large number of people waiting around the pool of, this, uh, of Bethesda, just waiting and watching, and waiting, and watching. Messiah shows up, and they just keep waiting and watching, looking at the water. Now when it comes to people, some wait for a more convenient season in their life to recognize Messiah. Some wait for dreams and visions. Some wait for signs and wonders. Some wait to be compelled. Some wait for revival. Some wait for particular feelings, and some wait for a celebrity to bring the good news about Messiah. Perhaps we, too, we should just really be provoked by the question, are we waiting for something or someone that's already been provided? There are a lot of people in these five pools, probably jam-packed, and there must have been great anticipation and excitement, yet so many people were just looking at the water, waiting and watching. They had God all boxed in, in that one, that only way that they could possibly be healed, and they weren't looking around at all, as Messiah is probably walking around and examining and checking out everything that's going on there. But many people ascribe the belief that seeing is believing, but that's not always true. Can you say amen? amen? In January 2007, the Washington Post did an experiment to test what people actually saw. Are you paying attention? They arranged for a young man, man named Joshua Bell to play music at the metro station. By most measures, he was a nondescript 
wearing jeans, a long sleeve t-shirt, and a Washington Nationals baseball cap. From a small case, he removed the violin, placing the open case at his feet. He threw a few dollars and some change as seed money. So for the next 45 minutes, Bell played Mozart and Schubert as over 1,000 people streamed by him, one after the other after the other, hardly taking notice. Now, had they paid attention, they might have recognized this young man for the world-renowned violinist that he actually was. They also might have noted that the violin that he played was a rare Stradivarius worth over $3 million in his hands in their presence. Now, just three days earlier, this same Joshua Bell sold out the Boston Symphony Hall in ordinary seats going for as much as $100 a piece. In the subway, Bell garnered about $32 from just 27 people who stopped long enough to give a donation. What we see is not always as it really is. We miss the signals that Jesus gives us. The people that day in the subway station just saw another out-of-work musician playing his violin, yet they missed the witnessing of this world-famous, brilliant musician play Mozart. And so it is with Jesus walking around these pools and they have no idea that's the Messiah. That's the one who can heal you. That's the one who can set you free. That's the one who can give you purpose and meaning in this life. So Jesus asked this man this peculiar question. Do you want to be made well? Now the question is sincere and it's simple. And the fact that so many people are discouraged, they're convinced that perhaps God doesn't want to heal them. Not everyone wants to be healed. Change would be too scary. They get so used to the life that they've developed that now they're scared to let go of it. Some are stuck in a state of hopelessness. This man perhaps was like that. He not only had withered legs, but I bet he had a withered heart. So Jesus asked the question, do you want to be made well? He sends that same signal, that same question to you and I. Do you want to be made well? If all of us are honest and we were to sit down and just took off all the guards and you know, our, our, our poker faces, and we were to ask the question, hey, is there one little area in your life that you could be made whole in? Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's concerns. Maybe it's indignation. Maybe it's bitterness. I don't know what it is, but you do. And Jesus were to ask you, do you want to be made well? Are you willing to surrender to the loving Savior? Maybe it's freedom from fears. I don't know. Maybe it's rejection. I found a few examples of how people are stuck in fears and conditioned. You may have heard of what's called a Pike syndrome. The study was done with a uh, uh, a large pike and a really big fish tank and then a bunch of little bait fish were put in there, one after the, uh, the other. And what you know, the, the pike fish came and gobbled them up and gobbled them up and gobbled them up. So then they decided to take these same minnows, this bait fish, and put them in a fairly large glass bowl with a lid up. And they put all these minnows, all these fish in here and then they dropped them back into the large fish tank. And the pike kept on banging his nose into it, banging his nose into it, trying to get it. Of course, he couldn't get it. The minnows were safe. And then finally, after a period of time, they decided to take the minnows, release the minnows back into the environment without the glass. And wouldn't you know, the pike had been so conditioned, it stopped going after the minnows. You may have heard the elephant syndrome. It's a similar situation. This one's a little more sad, if you will. At a very young age, elephants, young elephants are stripped from their mamas, and they're kind of beaten into submission and trained how to lay down and get ready for the big show. They tie this massive rope around them, this massive peg in the ground that's pounded in, and there's no way this baby elephant can get out of it. 
So when they finally put him into the big top and the big circus, the, the, the rope is much less and the stake in the ground is much less, but the animals are massive and they have no idea they can actually rip it out of the ground so that they're stuck there. They are conditioned that there's no way out. Finally, the dog syndrome. Now there's two approaches I wanted to take with this. Uh, one was a sad approach, and the other one's a happy approach. So I'm gonna take the happy approach. So what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna play a video in a second here. And it's gonna show you how dogs can be conditioned as well. So what you're gonna see in a video is there's two doors. One is like a solid door, and you open it up to a screen door. Check out the video really quick. Very open glass and screen. But they shall go out. But I. We <laughs> open the door. But I. They open it. They open the door. They open it. But I can make them reach out. But I. You guys got it, right? There used to be glass in that door. And that dog was trained. The dog was conditioned a certain way. Now we laugh, we think about the, the dumb fish or the poor elephant or the silly little dog, but you know, if we're really once again brutally honest and we examine our lives. We're conditioned in a lot of ways that creates a lot of doubt. Like my, my pitching, you know, it caused doubt. I looked around a little bit and I freaked out. And you might do that as well. You might have doubts about things in your life. But it really pleases the Father when we have faith, when we trust in Him. And the more we get to know Him, the more we get to know His Word, the more we can continue to trust Him and take steps of faith. And we can step through that glass door, or we can rip out that peg, or we can fight when we need to fight. Far too many people have been conditioned to reject the claims of Jesus. Now that might sound odd to the majority of people in, here, in this room today that know and believe Jesus as Lord and Savior. You believe what he did, and why he did it, and how he did it, and that he was raised on the third day. He's not the right hand of the Father, but so many people in this world are so conditioned to say that if Jesus was, then why this? Or if he really was, why that? And I don't believe this, and I don't believe... So there's a conditioning that goes on with people typically outside these four walls that need to hear your testimony. Because your testimony can pierce the darkness. People cannot say, well, that's not true. You didn't really experience that. Testimonies are powerful. We need to share that with so many people. Jesus, indeed, is a way maker. Maybe it's not physical limitations in your life. Maybe it's mental. He's able to heal anything if we're paying attention that he desires. At the end of the service, I'd love to I'd ask you to get up out of your seats and come on up for prayer. We'd love to pray with you guys. And ask God to bless you. Let's go to verses 7 through 9 now. And the lame man responds to Jesus. So the sick, crippled man uh, said uh, respectfully to Jesus, he used the word, Sir, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. So if I were Jesus, I'd say, What am I, chopped liver? I'm not a man here. But so you kind of hear a, a, a excuses, kind of a tone of excuses. Most of us do, do this whether we want to or not. Uh, this presupposition that puts limits on the way God can heal. This guy puts this limit. He boxes in God saying, well, I can't get in the pool. That means God can't, God can't heal me. And he says, another steps down before me. Well, alas, to check this guy's crippled, so he can't step down. That's another excuse. The type of thing that really does box God in if we're not careful. Puts limits on a limitless God. But this is what Jesus says. He gives him three commands. He says, number one, he says, rise. Did you guys see that? The second one, he says, take up your bed or your mat. And the third one, he says to walk. So Jesus told him to do that. 
after 38 years of not being able to walk, this guy gets up, takes his bat, and he walks away. Could you imagine the people around him, the peripheral? I mean, there's, there's no word in the story that says people around him watch and listen to him. It would have been astonishing. Because they knew this guy. All these guys probably knew each other. Astonishing to watch this guy stand up and walk away. They had to have been blown away by all this. This, this uh, paralytic man could easily have said to Jesus, yeah, right, like you're going to heal me? Come on now. He didn't do that. He trusted Jesus and he did what he said. He took him at his word. Too many of us are not trusting God for big stuff. The stuff that's outside of the waters, the normal. You know what the normal is. It's, well, I've never heard of that, so it can't possibly be true. Oh, you're, that's wide-eyed wonder. That's, that's not really true. How do you believe that? Yeah, I know the Bible says it, but that's back then. I mean, don't we make excuses so often for things that we don't think God's really going to do? We dismiss it. No, I don't think so. And if we're not careful, we're going to be just like that cute little dog. The window's gone, but man, this is the way it's always been, so I'm not going to go through it until somebody actually opens the door. Then I can go through it. we got to be careful. Verse 9 says, And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. Bam. Healed. Without ever touching the water. Can you guys say, bam? Bam. That's awesome. The New Testament describes um, a number of different ways people are healed. In James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, talks about people coming up and the elders laying hands on them and anointing them with oil, praying for them. Mark 16 talks about that God's people can lay hands on each other and ask for God to heal. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 9 says that God may grant someone the gift of healing, either that they are directly healed or have the power to bring healing to another by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 9, 22 says that God may grant healing in response to a faith of another on behalf of a person, if you will. Healing can come. Now we see in the way that this man reacted, it kind of makes you wonder a little bit and think about it. Or maybe even realize and question, okay, so this guy was healed physically. You've got to ask the question, do you think he was healed spiritually? Not everybody who gets healed physically is healed spiritually. They might say, man, Jesus, that was great. Thank you so much and live like the devil. So here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Jesus did it on the Sabbath day. This is when things really start to heat up. This is the part of the whole thing I like. We're going to stir those guys up. So let's look at verses 10 through 13. These Jewish leaders ignore, totally ignore the miracle, and they take offense at the healing. So the Jews therefore said, John, John, by the way, uses this term throughout the gospel, as it implies the sense of Jewish leaders or religious establishment, not necessarily Jews. Rem a reminder, ding, 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 Jesus is Jewish. Jesus' disciples are all Jewish, so Jesus is not bashing Jews. He's, he's hammering these religious leaders, these people in authority. With abuse of power. So he says, to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath and is not, say not, not. it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. And I want to say, are you kidding me? Well, if you were there, wouldn't you say that? You'd say, come on, man, are you kidding me? This guy had walked for 30 days, he picks up his mat and walk, and you're talking to him about carrying a mat? Are you kidding me? This is a violation of the interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures. Somehow, Jesus, however, insisted that it is indeed lawful to do good things on the Sabbath. And Jesus said this in verse 11. He, this man who was healed, answered them. Uh, it was like a, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm getting in trouble. So he said it sheepishly. He, he who made me well said to me, take up my mat and walk. This guy is fearful of these guys. The scaredy cat caves in to the fears of their authorities. In reality, um, he really should have been so incredibly excited and saying, dude, 
I just was here for 38 years. See this mat? Now I'm going to do some laps around the temple, baby. I don't care if it's a Sabbath or nothing. I am excited. He sheepishly cowers them. So we think, I mean, if we were in that guy's shoes, we think that I would run around the temple and I'd say forget it. But ultimately, if you guys have been driving down, let's say 95 or US 1, and you look in the rearview mirror and you got those blue lights. <laughs> How tough do you feel at that moment? I know my heart races and says, dang, I haven't gotten in trouble since I was like 19, and I'm still afraid of going to jail because I was going seven miles over the speed limit. But it's kind of the fear that happens. It makes you a little bit nervous, and you think for just a minute. So I'd like to give a little bit of an example of perhaps, of, in contrast, the craziness of these Jewish leaders, if, if you're driving down US-1, you're, a, you're an ambulance driver, you're doing your thing, and you've got somebody in the back, and they're working on him, he just had a heart attack, and they're rushing to Martin Memorial, they're zipping by over here, you hear the sirens going, and these guys are working away, working away, and next thing you know, the blue lights show up around them. They drive around alongside him, and they say, pull over! And the driver's going, dude, heart attack in the back! And he says, Pull over! No, well, uh, no, no! Then the, the cop cuts in front of him and he has to pull over. Walks up to him. Uh, driver's license, registration, please. <laughs> the driver's saying, Dude, there's a heart. It's the law, dude. There's no special exception for speeding for you guys. Do, do you see how ridiculous that is? Saving somebody's life and pulling them over. That's where you've got to separate and know the difference between grace and the law. Right. The law was not made that we had to be, it's be punished by it. Now, granted, having a speed limit of 45 is probably a pretty good thing. Otherwise, there'd be Looney Tunes like when I was 19, driving 110 to see if I could make it through the light. That'd be a really, really bad situation. So laws are good, amen? amen. Verse 12. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? So these guys, they probably know it's Jesus. These leaders didn't give a rip about the healing at all. They just wanted to know who encouraged you to break the law. But the one who has healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and the multitude being in the stuff. Could you imagine that? Jesus didn't sit around and say, okay, great, I just did a great healing. Let's have a crusade now and pass the collection plate. Aren't I great? Seriously, he didn't go on TBN and say, hey, look, I just healed this guy at the pool, and you guys ought to, you know, and that's not condescending in, in and of itself. It is, though, amplifying the humility of our Savior. And if we're supposed to be like Jesus and reflecting a life that lives and loves like Jesus, should we not be like that as well? No parade, no fanfare, just a everyday miracle, if there could be such a thing. I, I, I'm pretty sure that these leaders knew it was Jesus. So we look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. So that really begs the question, so why do you think Jesus searched this man out in the temple? He had no clue. Jesus knew exactly who he was. Jesus probably knew everybody around the pool, every single one that had an issue or a problem. And we don't know if that was the only healing. We don't know if there was a number of healings. But this guy in particular, Jesus zeroes in on. And Jesus is still concerned with him. And this is why I believe that this guy did not have a spiritual awakening. He did not have a born-again experience. Because Jesus is still concerned about him. He gets healed. And now Jesus is going to seek him out. You know, the biggest concern that I think that any of us might have is that people take their last breath and enter eternity separated from the living God. You see, God is gracious. He's humble. He's loving. He's kind. He's caring. But he's not going to make us love him back. That, that's unconditional love, but he's not going to force his love on anybody. 
So we look at it again. It says, and he said to him, verse 14, see, you have been made well. So this guy probably says, ah, you're the guy who healed me. Ah, now I know who you are. You're the guy that everybody's been talking about. Oh, you're Jesus. That is awesome. But Jesus says, sit no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So what does he mean by that? Well, does Jesus mean that sin is related to physical sickness? So this is a doctrine that can be tricky if you're not careful. Uh, if you're not careful, uh, probably not in this case, but we don't know for sure. Um, sin can be organic, can be physiological. Um, some of it can just be brought on by yourself. I mean, let's face it: if, if all you do is is eat uh, like McDonald's French fries and drink Coca-Cola for the next 10 years, you're probably going to have physiological problems by itself. John chapter 9 says this. Oh, quick clarification on it. There was an account of a man who was born blind, and the disciples asked Jesus, was this man born blind because of his parents' sins or because of his own sins? Really, it was neither. But Jesus responds with this. Jesus said that it is for the glory of God, and Jesus healed his blindness. So this guy was allowed to be blind all those years. Jesus touched him, and immediately he can see and it was for the glory of God. However, I want to swing the pendulum back over a little bit. We should be careful and realize that open-eyed rebellion against God that refuses to be dealt with, frankly, can lead to sickness or a ruined life or both. Like we talked about with the rebellious son a couple weeks ago, if people would realize that but the sincerely, sincerely confessed sins bring cleansing and healing and forgiveness. That would be so cool if the whole entire world got that, because then all psychologists and psychiatrists and big pharma would go down the tank. And I get an amen. There is indeed freedom in forgiveness. It says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Many other things can be mentioned here, but let's zero in on this desire for a solution, and that is the freedom that comes from a surrendered life in Jesus Christ. So let's look at verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. It's his fault. Now this right here is um, telling, considering the fact that he reported back to the Jewish authorities. Well, let's now look at verses, read verses 16 to 23. And then we're going to wrap up our study. You can follow along. For the reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Oh, my. Because Jesus answered them. My father has done this. what Jesus says back to these guys. They must have confronted him. I don't know if there's a whole tribe of them or not. But, but Jesus answered them. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Basically saying... You know, that Sabbath you're talking about, man, I'm busy doing the Father's business. Too bad, so sad. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. There it is, second time. They want to kill him because he broke the law, but now he's claiming to have a special relationship with God the Father. He says, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his Father, making himself Equal with God. Say that. Equal with God. Equal. Right there in the scriptures. He is not an angel. He is not just this man. He is God man. He is God in the flesh. Verse 19, then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, he said, basically, you better believe it, dudes. I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you man may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, hallelujah, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to, say it, the Son. That all should honor the Son. Just as, here it, again, here it is again, just as they honor the Father, equal again. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. 
But let's take a look at verse 16 again. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. They were very serious about this because he had done these things in the South. Now, we think that, oh, this is back 2,000 years ago. So let me let, let, me let you in on a secret here. Um, the Hasidic Jews still have strict adherence to the law. Now, we all know the Ten Commandments, but they weren't happy with ten. They wanted to pile on more and more and more. So they added 603 more. So these Jews have 613 laws to hear about. So these, this strict adherence can be tracked back to April 1992. Um, there was a news article that tenants watched three apartments in an Orthodox neighborhood in Israel burn while they asked the rabbi whether a telephone call to the fire department on the Sabbath would violate Jewish law. Observant Jews are forbidden to use the phone on the Sabbath because doing so would break an electrical current which is considered a form of work. In the half hour, it took the rabbi to, to decide, yes, go ahead and call the fire department. To spread the, the fire spread the two neighboring apartments in the first three burned to the ground. The law is good. But it's not designed to operate that way. So verse 17. But Jesus answered that my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Granted, Genesis 2.2 says that God stopped all work and rested. So the standard for taking time off is still set. We should take time to rest. Amen. Rest is needed. needed. However, if someone drops over in front of you, having a heart attack, you can't say, well, if today's a Sabbath, I can't help you out, sorry. That's just dumb. Not only that, but Jesus was claiming a unique relationship with God the Father. That, to the Jews, was blasphemous. That infuriated them. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but also had this relationship with God the Father was equal with God. So, there it is right there, this massive bomb that Jesus is co-equal with God. This is a big reason why Jesus was and still is hated by so many. And that's why oftentimes we are hated by so many. Because we have this narrow-minded idea that Jesus is the only way. Where do we come up with that? Well, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So we're just saying, this is what the Bible says. You believe the Bible? Yeah, I believe the Bible. Jesus is the way. He said, wide is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. Have you surrendered to Jesus? Jesus is bold about this. Um, verse 19 says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Jesus is bold about this and says, It with great authority. In verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things, that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel, that you may be astonished. In verse 21, for us, the Father raises the dead. Do you guys see that? That's amazing. Raises the dead and gives life to them, and that's whoever he should choose. So the Son gives life to whom he will. He gave new life to this man supernaturally, miraculously. And he offers this new life to everybody. Have you been paying attention to the signals? Is there something in your life that you know, deep in your heart, that's stirring, that you know you've been missing it, you've not been paying attention? For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You guys realize that, you know, it's just, oh, that's awful judgmental. You know, have you ever walked into a courtroom, maybe for a speaking ticket or, I don't know, maybe, maybe something worse when you were younger? You walk into the courtroom, and there's this guy up there with a gavel, and this big, he's highly exalted. He's called a judge, right? Right. Does that make him judgmental? Shake your head, yeah. Of course it does. So he is judgmental, but does he not have the authority, the position to be judgmental? So Jesus is judgmental, is he not? He's not just the judge, but he's also the jury. He doesn't need counsel. So when, when Jesus makes these claims, 
It's because he has the authority. He has the God-given. God the Father gave him that role in all of our lives. So we get to say, no thanks, Jesus, when we say, yes, Jesus. We get that choice. He has laws that expects to be upheld, but the most important signal is that he loves you and he cares for you. It's a good song. <laughs> Jesus himself indeed said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no man come to the Father but by me. So we're going to conclude the service as I ask the prayer team to come up. I don't know if we have a prayer team. Anybody that wants to come up for prayer, we'll delight in with prayer, prayer warriors. Anyone wants to come up, the great worship team to come up. And so in conclusion, Today we started the message with pitching to Jesus. Are you pitching to Jesus? Are you throwing to Jesus? Are you paying attention to his signals? First we saw Jesus heal a lame man by the pool. He had no idea who Jesus was, nor were the people around him knew who he was. But Jesus questions this man. Do you want to be made well? So one more time, do you want to be made well? Is there something going on in your life that you need prayer for? Today would be the day to do it. Like Joshua Bell, right there, this guy was, people just walked by him. People just walked by Jesus. Are you paying attention? Or are like you that pike, just banging your head, banging your head, or like the elephant stuck to a little peg that you can just rip out. Or the happy little dog. And everybody wants to be like the happy little dog, right? Jesus heals this lay man and tells him to get up, take your mat, and walk. And he did. He tells us to confess our sins. Why harbor sins in your own life if you can get free from it? I mean, it's a bondage, it's a prison to hang on to sins. He wants to cleanse us and free. Then we see the Sabbath controversy. Having a day of rest is important, but not at the expense of healing. Jesus claims to be God's son. People are going to be offended by that. But we are called to be a light in the dark, in this dark world. We need to share the love of Jesus. And again, one of the most effective ways to do that is with our testimony and with our message. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. That's an audacious claim to make. So we have to have the courage, we have to have the desire to want to invite people to come to know Jesus. Jesus is a way maker. Have you trusted him as the Lord? Now we've gone over uh, time a little bit today, but what I'd like to do is to you show me something, Sid. So what I'd like to do is, is join me in prayer. If you guys could bow your heads. The scriptures tell us to be still and know that I'm God. Lord, there are, there are hearts spinning and turning and minds that are restless, things that are going on in people's worlds that are, wow, they are just seem like out of control. But I know, Lord, that when we take our eyes off of you like Peter did, all we see is the storm. So help us to recognize and realize and confess that we know that you're an ever-present help in time and time. So, Father, if there is someone here today that perhaps has never surrendered their life to you, Lord, and they know they need to today, so if that describes you, I would love for you to raise your hand so I could be praying for you. We could be praying for you throughout the week. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. I've got a sister that's raised her hand. Praise God for that. The angels rejoice when someone says yes to Jesus. Father, there is people here today that are going through some really difficult that only you can bring peace in that storm to. So if that describes you, can you please raise your hand so we can be praying for you as well. I know the storms are so brutal, they're so difficult, that, Lord, I, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you might just 
manifest your presence and wrap your arms around all these precious saints that might experience your love, might experience your presence, but most of all, they might experience your peace. Or as they go out there in that world, that they might stay underneath the shadow of your wings, they might experience your peace and your presence and power to get through things. And it's not by mind nor by power, but it's by your spirit's power that we pray these things. Father, I pray that anybody else that's uh, perhaps struggling with something, they might ask you to meet you where they're at. That they might begin to sense the signals. Perhaps it's a sound, perhaps it's a word, perhaps it's a friend, perhaps it's something that you've revealed to them, and you just, they just need confirmation for them. So I want you to bless their day today as we continue to exalt the name of Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we pray all these things by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's children. Amen. Amen.